So I'm busy dehydrating today, just uh, chopping up spare apples and pears. And we really <laughs> love dehydrated uh, fruits like this. Um, it's the only real way that I like eating preserved fruits and we don't do it like everybody else probably. We leave the pips in, the cores in and everything. These are the pears and you know they're just fine. The pips are actually the, by far the most nutritious part of the apple and of course the skin and just under the skin is the second most nutritious part so we leave it all in. It's a bit difficult to eat when the uh, fruits haven't been dehydrated but after they've been dehydrated they're all really nice and chewy anyway and so those tough bits are perfectly edible and as I say just extra nutritious and oh, I've got some examples here so these are apples that we dehydrated a few weeks ago we do put the date on them and some pears from last year and they're still in great condition so those were done 3rd of October 2020 and they're absolutely gorgeous and you can see on here probably that uh, you know the cores are all here and they're perfectly edible now once they've been dehydrated and they're probably edible before they've been dehydrated but we used to use a core like this to take the cores out. We were wasting so much, you know, we were wasting so much of the apple or pear and so much of the nutrition. So it seemed crazy. So I thought I would take this opportunity just to show you around our storeroom. But before I do that, I'll just mention that I'm putting these in water after I've chopped them up and I put a spoonful of vitamin C powder in. So we got this off Amazon, I think, and basically it just lasts forever. I think we've had this for about three years and still about half full. And the details of the dehydrator that we use, you'll find in my ebook chapter uh, that covers storing food. So if you wanna take a look at that, and you'll find some more videos and things like that about storing food. I don't fuss too much about the thickness of the slices, but I'm generally going for something kind of about like that. So I suppose that is seven or eight millimeters, something like that. It doesn't really matter. Um, now, Ronald, from Ruddle's car park growing area asked me how do you know when they're ready? Well there's plenty of guides on the web and I'll, I'll probably link to one in the ebook uh, that tell you roughly the temperature and the duration that you should use when dehydrating things. Um, so I'll repeat all that there but to be honest I like to do the taste test you know I just I love actually them when they're warm, uh, but when you taste them, you can kind of tell that there's a bit of moisture left in them. So it's just a good excuse to munch through a few of them. Um, taste obviously the thickest ones, so you probably pick that one or something like that. See whether there's any moisture left in it. Um, as I say, it's fairly easy to tell when you actually bite it. Just you know, pick two or three eat some of the thin ones, eat some of the thick ones, uh, you'll soon learn to tell the difference. And then that's such a reliable way, really, I think, of testing to see whether it's done. Because the times vary because you will, unless you're sort of superhuman, get slices that are thick and slices that are thin. And, uh, you know, so it's not, time is not a particularly perfect indicator. You can kind of overdo them um, and they'll still be fine, you know, because once they've lost all their moisture, they're not going to lose any more. Um, obviously you can go too far and completely fry them, but uh, 
generally speaking, you can give them an hour or two longer than you think they need and they'll still be fine. So there we go. I now put them on these wire trays. I really like the fact that our dehydrator has wire trays. I just think um, the plastic ones, I don't know, it just all seems a bit dodgy, exposing fruit uh, to plastic at high temperatures for long periods of time. But, you know, you might not worry about that. I can't say I worry about it, but given the option, I'd get metal trays. And we are now at the point, I think, where we have got pretty much everything harvested and preserved from summer. And every inch of the allotment and the garden pretty much is replanted now for autumn, winter and spring, which is the way I like to do it. It does mean you get slightly less of a harvest in summer perhaps. Not very much, you know, maybe 5% or something like that. But then we really like to eat everything fresh. So if we can, we will not be eating frozen or dehydrated foods. But of course, you know, apples and things like that, they only keep so long. So having the option to dehydrate them really makes a massive difference. And they're such a great snack for working on the allotments, you know, hiking, things like that. I mean, it's not that snacking is particularly good for you, but sometimes you just need a snack. So, yeah, I'm gonna stop this now, and I'm gonna show you around the store and the upgrades that I've done to it as well, because I've done a few. So this is our storeroom and it's got everything in it by the squashes. I'll show you those in a minute. So bottom shelf down here. So we've got a garlic. We will actually move this inside into wicker baskets once it gets a bit damper uh, so and colder. So probably sometime in November. And then we've got our storage shallots. And they do look beautiful, don't they? And then these actually are our overwintered onions. And these are Tough Ball and Shenshu Yellow. And they've stored <laughs> remarkably well. Um, yeah, so they're just as good really as the uh, main crop onions at the moment. They probably won't store all the way through until May, but uh, we're getting through them at quite a rate. And then these are our use now onions, uh, shallots rather, and so they're just getting used in salads and whatever recipes shallots are good for. And then these are our kind of use first red onions, more red onions, more red onions and a few white onions and you'll see quite a few mouse traps around. We do have occasionally mice in here and as soon as they find it it's best to do a kind of short sharp shock basically and catch them immediately before they tell their friends and family. So uh, works pretty well for us. We generally don't lose anything now that we've got these traps. The reason we've got quite so many in here is just because they'll soon be going, a few of these will soon be going to the allotment but uh, they're here right now. And then we've got some more onions. And of course, oh, more onions. So there's a lot of onions. We need a lot. You know, we use about one a day. Um, the rest of the family use about one a day. So, you know, we grow about a thousand onions uh, a year, main crop and overwintered. And also yeah, many thousands of salad onions, spring onions as well. So then we've got the beetroot here stored in damp wood chips and we've got these all marked up you know what type they are which ones are to use first and all that sort of thing and then there's a sack there 
full of beetroot and there's some more beetroot down there so quite a lot of beetroot that will be enough to last us until May uh, when the new crop beetroot is ready and in these bags are dehydrated apples and pears and oh yeah so in under here we have got potatoes and we basically just harvest our potatoes from containers outside every three weeks so in this box is just well a maximum of three weeks supply right now i think there's two weeks supply in there or one week supply i'm not quite sure debbie does the packing of the potatoes um we just find they keep better in the containers outside than they do in here and we basically have enough to get us through until may again when our new season potatoes are ready and we'll have new season main crop potatoes and new season um, new potatoes uh, so that we've got a continuity of all types of potatoes all year round so that i think is as i say most of what we've got in store we've got the um, squashes in the conservatory at the moment they're loving it in there we'll probably bring them in here later on in the year when we need the space in the conservatory for growing stuff but that probably won't be until march time i guess now so there's a few upgrades we've made in here we've put a fan in here just on a cheapest chips timer and uh, so that comes on sort of at one I don't know, 10 15 minutes every couple of hours i think and that just improves the ventilation around all of these uh, onions because we have had some issues with mold and that's one of the reasons why we kind of have them out like this so that we can always kind of keep an eye on them and spot little issues and what we've also got in here is a little tiny heater on its frost protection setting and so in theory that will just about keep this above freezing but ideally it will keep it in the sort of four degree centigrade sort of range and you might think that's a bit wasteful and it might be we'll have to see um, i'm hoping it's not and the reason is because we also have our fridge in here with a lot of allotment produce in it so there's loads of stuff in here and if it goes below freezing in here this fridge is fine it's one of those fridges that can cope with that it switches off and all that sort of thing but if it's if it goes below freezing some of the produce in the fridge can freeze and as you can see let's just have a look up here so right now i've got six salad mixes uh, and there's another load of stuff down there so let's say we've got 10 boxes at any typical point in time that's about 25 pounds worth of food and if we lose that that's 25 pounds lost and that's probably more than the cost of that little heater probably a lot more than the cost of that little heater and then we've got a freezer here which is again full of allotment produce and we do have another little freezer in the kitchen uh, but there's a lot of non-allotment produce in there as well so uh, i would say 80 percent of our allotment produce is in the garage freezer and then we've got the dehydrator there's the model and I've just got it on high at the moment. So for the first half an hour, I put it on really high uh, just to kind of kill anything, any bacteria or whatever on the surface of um, that fruit that I've just done. And we do have a general produce fridge in the kitchen as well. And that also is pretty full of homegrown stuff. So then all over the garden, as you'll, you'll see, there's piles and piles of potatoes in the containers and they're everywhere. There's another six down there and everywhere you look in the back garden. I'll have a quick look in the pantry cupboard. This is where all of our herbs and spices go. We do quite a lot 
our own herbs and spices and loads and loads of preserves of all sorts of different types so there's loads of passatas ketchups stocks um, pickles jams of all sorts of different descriptions you know like chili jams whatever pickled onions pickled garlic down there um, yeah just traditional jams marmalades chutneys all that sort of thing uh, and that's where we store the garlic later on in the year because it doesn't like to be too cold garlic so uh, this is a cool kitchen so it's probably about 60 degrees centigrade on average which is slightly too warm for garlic but it's not warm enough that it causes an issue and we don't generally keep our garlic beyond about the middle of April we have a little bit beyond there but not enough so that's why we've got pickled garlic and that's why we've got masses and masses of green garlic all sown outside and on the allotment and that is ready in April and that sees us through until the main crop garlic's ready so then in the conservatory on every shelf we've basically got squash so as I probably already mentioned, we don't really eat that much processed food, uh, whether it's preserved or frozen or anything like that. We eat 90% of what we eat is fresh, although obviously we do cook that on the day. Um, and it doesn't really matter what time of year. So in November, we've still got a lot of stuff. Obviously for Christmas, we've got a huge harvest. January dips a little bit, but we've still got plenty. February starts to pick up a bit. March, April and May got a massive abundance of uh, veg and we do buy fruit though so tomatoes and peppers and um, obviously apples pears cherries things like that we'll buy those out of season so it's only veg that we're self-sufficient in uh, and anything that we can preserve so obviously jams and passata mixes and things like that so that's pretty much it that's the way we eat my name is Steve this is the Seaside Kitchen Garden and Allotment Channel and I'll see you soon.